Oh dear. <coughs> I've done the wrong way. <coughs> oh, it went down the wrong way. So in the past year or so, I've become really interested in literary prizes, what they stand for, what they promote, any issues that surround them. Um, the Booker Prize and now the International Booker Prize are two of the like the most prestigious ones that I know of that I've been following. Um, along with the Women's Prize, they tend to be the one that, ones that generate the most hype, especially on BookTube, you tend to see the most about them. And so in the last couple of weeks, Yesterday, as I'm filming this, uh, the long list for the Booker Prize 2022 was announced. Um, I have only got one of those books on my TBR, and that is Trust by Hernan Diaz. So I thought I would do a little reading vlog, reading the the one book I have from the long list so far. I might I have looked through some of the other descriptions, and I think I'm going to have to borrow some of them from the library because some of them look really up my street. So, what is the trust about? So it says, a literary puzzle about money, power and intimacy. Trust challenges the myths shrouding wealth and the fictions that often pass for history. He is a legendary Wall Street tycoon. She is the daughter of eccentric aristocrats. Together they have risen to the very top. But at what cost have they acquired their immense fortune? This is the mystery at the centre of Bombs, a successful 1938 novel that all New York seems to have read. But there are other versions of this tale of privilege and deceit. Trust elegantly draws these competing narratives into conversation with each other, an intention with the perspective of one woman bent on disentangling fact from fiction. The result is a provocative and propulsive novel that spans an entire century and becomes more exhilarating with each new revelation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check in with you about the halfway point, I think. So I just hit the 25% mark on Trust. And from the blurb we know that the main theme, like holding everything together, is money. Um, wealth, the accumulation of wealth, the lack of wealth, all of these things. And so far, we're following two characters who are extremely wealthy. One of them has come from a not-so-wealthy background, but they are extremely wealthy. They are, you know, the top 1% type wealthy. And whilst this story so far has been quite engaging and really interesting... I would say that where people say, oh, is this a character-based story? Is it a plot-based story? This is a thematic-based story. Yes, obviously the character discussion is important. We're following the story of their life, but really it's the theme of money that holds this whole thing together and really pushes the narrative on. Um, and I really enjoyed it so far. Like, really enjoyed it. I think this is split up into, like, four separate stories, so I'm interested to see where it goes. But if it is another... 300 pages about this couple and their acquisition of wealth, the accumulation of wealth. I'm not sure how interesting it's going to be, <laughs> but yeah, so far really enjoyed it. The only sort of negative thing that I will say about it is one of the one of the things that's being sort of discussed is how because these people are so incredibly wealthy, there's a lot of discussion about how they almost become like mythical creatures or not eat like it's it's beyond celebrity it's like it's like stories that are passed down from generation to generation and yet no they're real people which is fine and i love that as like a theme but you don't need to keep mentioning it show me don't tell me and it is showing you like it is showing you how they're almost like completely above and outside of society simply because they are so wealthy and that's just who they are i, I was i was reading one particular page and i felt like it had said either on twice on one page or on two pages sub in, in a row about how mystical and mythical these people were. And I just thought, okay, I get the point. But yeah, really enjoying it. There's lots that I really love about it. There's lots of sort of references to wealth and every single thing in it so far. Every character point, every personality, every relationship, every like plot point has been about money. Like if you dig a little deeper money is at the base of it and yeah it's just it's really good <laughs> so I'll check in with you later before I finish the book I wanted to tell you I want to talk to you about what I think of literary prizes in general um so as I said the booker and the women's prize tend to generate the most buzz but from what I can see each of them has their own issues so for me one of the issues surrounding the booker prize is the sort of financial contribution that has to be made which I know has been addressed um, and the organisers of the Booker Prize have tried to reduce or waive the fee for indie publishers, but generally it sets a level of exclusion for indie or self-published authors, 
to access the Booker Prize to be able to submit their copies because if you are long listed or short listed you have to submit a certain amount of money to contribute towards marketing which I do understand I do understand it's a business model it has to keep going but it does inherently have this level of exclusion for certain novels um, and then the women's prize there's been a lot of controversy around the fact that applicants submissions have to declare their gender by law or as they're recognized by law or whatever the terminology is I'm afraid I'm not um, 100% knowledgeable about the definitions and things but there was a big scandal where um, a Kweke Amezi who was a previous winner shortlisted I can't remember who is non-binary called out the women's prize because the women's prize specifies that you have to be female um, as defined by law or whatever the terminology is and so as someone who is non-binary they were not able to join in the prize and so it is a bit exclusionary again inherently so the idea behind it was the reason it was set up in the first place was because they felt that the Booker Prize and other literary awards were too male-centric and they wanted to address that balance in the awards scheme, which is a brilliant goal to have, but by focusing on women it does exclude certain people and so it has its own issues. <laughs> I do have quite a few books from the Booker Prize, the Women's Prize and some other ones on my shelves and so I do want to do some reading vlogs where I'm sort of reading some of the previous year's entries, especially as I try to tackle my TBR, I think it'd be quite nice to group things and say, okay, these ones were actually recognised by these awards, so those will be coming. But um, I have done some more research once I knew about some of these issues surrounding the Booker and the Women's Prize. I started researching other awards that have come up since um, that are trying to address some of these issues and so I thought I'd tell you about some of them that I found. So I've got a video coming out that's going to be about the Goldsmith Prize which is one I have literally just found out about because I discovered this book at the library which is Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun by Sarah Lapido Manika. The Goldsmith Prize um, is dedicated to uh, acknowledging and recognising authors that are pushing the boundaries of fiction. Um, again, I have a few of these on my TBR, so expect some vlogs around that award. Um, we've got the Polari Prize. Now, this was initially set up in 2011, but it remained quite small until it seems the last couple of years where it's gained a bit of traction. But this one is, de is dedicated to recognising authors who are LGBTQ. We've got the Jalek Prize. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, which aims to recognise authors of colour who are British or resident in the UK. Um, that was first awarded in 2017, so quite a young one. Then we've got the Republic of Consciousness Book Award. Um, this one aims to celebrate small publishers, so the books submitted to this award are from publishers who publish fewer or up to 12 books per year. Uh, this one was first awarded in 2018, so again a very young one. Um, then we've got the Orwell Prize for Political Fiction. Now this one's on my list because I love political fiction. And whilst the Orwell Prize has been a long-standing award. It's only recently that they've set up a separate category that is for political fiction and that was first awarded in 2019. And then the other one that's on my list is the Barbellion Prize. I think this is the youngest on my list and this is dedicated to recognising um, the voices and lifting the voices of those who are ill or disabled and this was first awarded in 2020. I only heard about this one through Jen Campbell's booktube channel. I love Jen Campbell, I love her recommendations, I love the fact that she mostly reads or at least mostly promotes indie published books and yeah stuff that you just don't see being published or being promoted elsewhere so um, thank you Jen for <laughs> that little uh, influence there. Um, but yeah, so those are the prizes that I'm actually really keen to keep my eye on. And again, because they are newer, because they are less well known, I don't have so many of those books on my shelf. So those are the sorts of things that I'm going to have to borrow from the library. But I will be keeping you up to date. I will be doing videos on them because I do love them. So yeah, let's get back to the final bit of the book and see what I thought of the ending. I can't quite believe I'm saying this, but the sun has gone down really early. So it's not even that late but we're already struggling with lighting. But anyway, I am now halfway through Trust and it's starting to become a little bit more obvious. So it, as I said, it's split into four. We have a novel, 
at the beginning, then we have an autobiography, then a memoir, and then something else. When I last spoke to you, I was only in the novel. Um, but then we move into the autobiography, and the names are different, but it's about the same people. And it takes a little moment to sort of realise that. But it's about the gentleman from the novel, and it's really interesting going from a novelization of a story to the, one of the main characters' real-life experience of it. Um, so that was a really interesting juxtaposition. And then now I've moved into the part that's the memoir, which is a memoir from someone who became involved in the life of this gentleman, but is not, like, directly involved. Um, so his autobiography is in, like, a draft state so it's not a full account of his life there are bits that are really like oh insert anecdote here or insert examples of this like it's not a full account um and it's it just shows how self-centered people are and like I think this is why I don't actually read autobiographies is because it's a bit like you think someone should care that much about your life <laughs> whereas the memoir and I think this is a really interesting bit is that the novel is a very dramatised version of events. The autobiography shows how much the man thinks of himself. And then in the memoir, it's quite beautifully written. It's clearly by someone who knows how to write and it's, you know, quite poetic in its language. I'm interested to see where this goes. And one of the things I really loved was that in, as I said, in, in the first one, in the novel, it's all about how mythical these rich people are. And yet it's all really played up and it's, oh, they were perfect for each other, this couple, and, and oh, money didn't really mean anything and oh once you have wealth it doesn't matter if you're um, distanced from people and all these sorts of things and then in the account that's actually f like the autobiography it's it's just a normal person it's just a normal person obsessed with money it's just a, I want to show how much money I have and I'm not the villain because I have money uh you know who who cares if the market crashes the the market needed purging and yeah she's really interesting like the confidence and the arrogance in the autobiography of this man who you think is like this quiet, unassuming man from the novel. And then, yeah, so I've just got into the memoir. So at the moment, the author, so it's a female, the author of the memoir hasn't actually got to the point where she's met the protagonist. She's still sort of building up to it and building up about her, her backstory. So, yeah, that's quite interesting because that's now from a perspective of someone who doesn't have money and the issues that surround not having money and when she like I'm interested to see how when she like butts heads with I say butts heads I don't know if there's going to be any fight but yeah anyway that's me checking in halfway point okay we finished trust and it's time for me to now wrap up my thoughts on the book and I think that is this is one of the hardest books to summarize that I have ever read like I was trying last night to write up my thoughts for for my official uh, net galley review and for um, putting on my own blog, <laughs> but it is really really difficult to help me with sort of gathering my thoughts. I thought I'd look at some other reviews to see if other people felt the same way that I did about it. And one of the most interesting and sort of detailed ones that I watched on YouTube was Matthew Sharapella. Sh hope I've not pronounced his name wrong. Um, I'm only, I'm very new to his channel. I've only recently found him. So, um, and I, but I do love how in depth he goes in his reviews. But interestingly enough, his was one of my favourite reviews of the story, even though he has a very different opinion of it than I do. I, I often think it's the people who disagree with our perspectives that offer the most intriguing insights and help us to form our own opinion. So I'll talk about mine and then I'll talk about how mine differ from his. <laughs> the Trying to summarise the book and to explain without it sounding overly complicated and overly complex is really difficult but essentially we have four parts to the story. So through my vlog you've seen me talking about the first couple of parts. I was going to do a three quarters update but I ended up getting so invested that I just read straight through to the end. But we start with a novel which is written by a fictional author called Harold Vanner. The novel is called Bonds. And in Bonds, we meet a couple 
and we experience their lives. So the novel itself is not fascinating. It is not a plot driven story. It is a character driven story and you're just exploring their life. So it's not the most riveting of novels but I was really intrigued by it. I felt really drawn in by it and what I thought going into that because I didn't know the structure of trust as a whole book I thought we were going to have four sections that were similar to that but about different people and exploring different ideas of wealth which is not what this book is. In the next section we're reading like a rough draft of an autobiography by an individual called Andrew Bevel and I say rough draft because whilst there are some facts in it and some narrated bits there are also sort of footnotes and links saying um, add in extra examples or add in explanation of this or links back to XYZ chapter or further explain in XYZ chapter. So it's not a fully formed autobiography. It is a draft. But I thought that was a really clever um, storytelling idea from Hernan Diaz because it missed out the bits that we didn't care about only really giving us extra information where we needed it. Obviously there were some that we didn't really need, but it had to be somewhat fleshed out as an autobiography. But it just sort of gave us enough of an insight into Andrew, or enough of an insight into who we think Andrew is becoming, or is... <laughs> Again, it's really hard to explain. But it gives us enough of a picture of the person writing it to realise, A, that it is the real-life character portrayed in the novel that we first read. So in the novel, I can't think what the man's name is in the novel, I can only think of him as Andrew Bevel now, but the husband, the man in the novel is Andrew Bevel. And so now we've got this layer of mystery because we're trying to work out how his portrayal of himself and his portrayal of his wife, who is called Mildred in real life, real life, are different to how they're portrayed in the novel but also, can we trust this man's word? As an autobiography, it's going to be his perception of himself, his perception of his wife, and also the way that he wants to be portrayed to the public and not necessarily the truth. So it's quite an interesting. I can see why people dislike this section of the book because this, from what I've seen across reviews, is the bit that most people dislike and perhaps the part that most people would perhaps DNF the book if they were doing that. I think a lot of people are are persevering because it's book along listed and I think everyone's glad they do but I think that in the future this is the point where most people would DNF because this is one of the most jarring sections to read. The tone of voice that Andrew Bevel has is so arrogant and so self-aggrandizing that he just becomes so obnoxious and you don't want to hear his perspective. <laughs> he thinks he's the bee's knees but I think that's a really clever sort of plot device, character device we then move into section three, and this is a memoir. And when I last spoke to you, all I knew was that she was a woman who was working for Andrew Bevel. I didn't know in what capacity she was working for him, I don't think. I may, I may be proved wrong by my own previous clips. But anyway, it turns out she's been hired to help him write his autobiography. So what we've just read is actually her writing. He basically dictates facts to her and things that he wants included and then she is expected to go away and turn it into an autobiography. But what she does is really interesting because her first drafts he doesn't really like. He doesn't like it when she puts too much information in about his wife. He wants a very specific set of facts known about his wife um, and they are completely irrelevant facts basically um, and the truth of them we find out is not really there but the interesting thing that she does when she realises he doesn't like the way that she's writing it is she goes and she researches autobiographies written by great men of America, um, from previous presidents to other big financial men. And she has an interesting phrase that she uses. But essentially she's saying that she's created her own Frankenstein's monster out of the tones of voice of all of these great men, great men, to create what she thinks Andrew Bevel wants to sound like. And when she presents this uh, draft to him, it is. It's exactly what he wanted. It was exactly the tone of voice he wanted. Basically, he wanted to sound like a great man. And so this memoir starts to shed light on how Andrew Bevel wants to be seen. This is also giving us more information about the difference between the Andrew Bevel of reality and the Andrew Bevel of the novel. 
and you start to think, well, we, what do we know about Mildred? What do we know about her and the difference between the novel, Andrew's depiction, and then what our author is starting to realise? And, and by author, I mean the fictitious author, Ida Partenza, who is writing the memoir in part three. Her section is actually written in sort of the 1980s, after Andrew Bevel and his wife have both died and their uh, main home has been turned into a museum. So she's going there to start researching Mildred and start working out whether the Mildred she was writing about back then is what the reality was. So we're starting to see that throughout this book, yes, there are definitely themes of wealth and power um, and whether we can trust different depictions. So I think trust is a really interesting title for the book because it not only refers to the financial side of what's going on and how the money is being made, but it also refers to whether we can trust the ways that people are written about. But yeah, so we're starting to realise that the mystery that we're following is who is Mildred Bevel? Is she Harold Vanner's, whatever her name was, Miss Brevort, I can't think what her name was in that book. Is she Andrew Bevel's caring and um, homely wife at figure? Or is she something else? Is she a mix of the two? And then the final part is actually the diaries of Mildred. But it's, the, it's just the diary of her at the end of her life. So when she's in hospital dying of cancer and she's decided to start taking notes on things. So part of it is a bit of a confessional about um, her part in her husband's financial gains. But because it's not written to explain herself, she doesn't know that after her death all this stuff is going to be written about her. It's not entirely that. So it's it's part confessional, but it's also interspersed with her musings on life, details of her illness and her treatment, other details about her life and regrets and aspirations. So a lot of people have mentioned that the ending is really unsatisfactory because it doesn't round out the story. But what it does do is make Mildred a very real person. <laughs> so um, I thought it was brilliant. I gave it five stars. I think... On Storygraph, where I'm allowed to give um, like half stars, I would give it 4.5. Because yes, the subject matter, New like the New York stock market, is not something that I'm particularly interested in. Um, I do think that this method of storytelling would be amazing in another context as well. Like I just think there could be other stories to apply this to that I would prefer. But I thought this was magnificent. I thought it was brilliant. I loved how it turned this relatively simple story of a wealthy couple and their ascent to even wealthierness <laughs> and turned it into a mystery and wove in themes of how women's lives are retold and reshaped by the men, the power, the money around them. How Mildred Basically, if we hadn't found her diaries, and it's only this one woman that has found her diary, seagulls, nobody knows who she really is. Not, like, because she kept herself quite excluded from society because of her extreme wealth and because of gossip and um, the press, nobody really knew her. But yeah, I thought it was brilliant. The way the mystery was unravelled, the way the themes were woven through it, I just thought it was masterful. And if the rest of the Booker Prize long, long list are this good, then I'm gonna to have to read some more of them. I have reserved a couple. So I thought I'd just mention here some of the ones that intrigue me because not all of them intrigue me. Um, but I have reserved a couple from the library. So let me just get up my library reservation list because uh, they've not come in. I'm guessing I'm gonna be on a massive waiting list for these, but definitely Nightcrawling. That one's on the top of my mind. Nightcrawling by uh, Layla Motley. Case Study by Graham McRae Burnett, After Sappho by Selby Wynne Schwartz, The Trees by Percival Everett. Yeah, those are the ones that really intrigue me, but this one was brilliant. This one was fantastic. So I, got, I was reading this through an arc through NetGalley, but I will be adding this to my wish list because I want to own a physical copy of this because it's brilliant. Um, oh, actually, I will say... I also want to add Glory by Noviolet Bulawayo to my list because originally I was like, oh, I don't really want to read another sort of animal farm type book because that 
narrative does not necessarily interest me. I found Animal Farm brilliant. I, you know, I wouldn't seek out books that are written from animal perspectives. However, in an upcoming vlog that's coming out soon, I read um, Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun. I didn't realise when I picked it up that it's actually very much inspired by Mrs Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. And I loved picking out the ways in which it was inspired by it, but then the ways in which it brought it to a modern audience and the way that um, it brought diversity into the story where Mrs Dalloway is very much not diverse at all. But I loved seeing those links and picking them out. And so actually I would now like to read Glory because I only read Animal Farm in January this year. So I'd love to read that and do the same thing, like see how they interact and how um, no, Violet has brought it into a much more modern and sort of diverse setting and what that can teach me about the area th that No, Violet is talking about. <laughs> that probably made no sense whatsoever, but hopefully you picked up my meaning that I, that idea of books that link to each other actually really interests me and so that's why I want to read Glory as well. The other ones on the list, I'd have to be convinced to read... I probably would like them, I don't know, but um, those those ones that I've mentioned, those are the ones that I am really interested in reading. So, so yeah, hope you enjoyed this. I will link to the other videos of other channels that I've mentioned, so Matthews. I don't, I'm also going to link to KD... KD Reads? KD? Because they, him and Freshly Reads, are doing... Oh, Holly. KD Books. <laughs> because obviously they're doing their read the book along list series and that's another channel that I recently discovered and really love I love the way that he reviews books so yeah I'll link those all down below thank you <laughs>